Happy to have you with us again this week. We're getting ready for TCU and Oklahoma State in Fort Worth, a battle of unbeatens and teams ranked in the top 15. If you don't mind, let's jump back to last week for a moment. There was a lot going on. You dealt with a lot of injuries in the first half. You dealt with Texas Tech playing a different quarterback than you anticipated. You know, given some inexperience in a lot of areas, how did you feel about that looking back on that? Because there was a lot of things that had to happen on the fly during the course of that game. It was an interesting game. Uh, It started with them playing a quarterback that we weren't expecting, um, who we found out is a really good player. And uh, I was hoping he was a senior, but he's a freshman. So he's going to be an issue in this league for a few years. Secondly, we had some guys go down that uh, made it a difficult uh, transition for us, uh, particularly offensively. And then we start having a few guys go out defensively with um, DeMarco going out and then Corey going out. Um, There's times Xavier wasn't in there. So it was very unusual, as you said, uh, which is pretty accurate. But our culture is really strong. Our players, our coaches do a good job of staying poised and coming up with solutions. Here's the hand we've been dealt. What do we need to do to keep this thing going? Uh, and it it was all through the game in different areas. But I was proud of the, the group uh, and the way they handled it and found a way to win the game. Something that gets hidden in all of this, and I do mean the pun, by the way, is hidden yards. Mm-hmm. Your average starting field position was the 37-yard line. Texas Tech's average starting field position was a 22. When you do the math, it's in the neighborhood of 250 hidden yards. Sure. In the Baylor game, there was about 120 hidden yards in field position. In this era where a lot of people are, are going with the numbers and, and going for fourth downs, we look at these last two games, your hidden yards advantage has been huge. That People don't understand, do they, how big of a deal that is. Sure, it's a big deal. It's like we talked about for years and years playing against Coach Schneider at Kansas State, and his hidden yards were special teams, yards, and penalties. And, I mean, if you have 100 extra yards and then the other team in those areas, that's one length of the football field. That's that's seven points. So, fortunately, we've got great uh, special teams play and target punting, and we were able to get some stops on some of those fourth downs they went for late in the game. What do you feel like needs to happen to give your run game another boost to go to the next level? Uh, we need to – we got to cover guys up better. Um, for the most part, we did. But when you turn guys loose, you start making cuts in the backfield, it's not good. Um, we're getting a lot out of Dom, uh, and he's a powerful physical back. We like that tough running game. But once he adjusts and starts making guys miss a little more, you're going to pick some yards up. Uh, and then there's times we got to get 23. Nixon's got to get in there some. As we bring um, Jackson along, he's got to get in some. They're a little different t- body type running back. But for the most part, we need to cover up defensive players up front. We need really good physical linemen to try to get past the line of scrimmage before we make a cut. As far as Spencer Sanders is concerned, He's rushed the ball 31 times the last two games, which we knew going into the season he would run the ball a lot. You said that many times. Right. What's the balance between utilizing a great weapon, rushing the football, but also keeping an eye on making sure that that he stays as healthy as he can, you have him for the long term? How do you balance that? Well, and you try to protect him when you can. Okay. The, The quarterback run game is so effective in college football, it's just hard to get away from. So the direction it's going, particularly with quarterback run game, it forces the defense to use an extra player to stop the run, which takes him out of pass coverage. So it's really a simple math. Secondly, quarterbacks that have the ability to avoid the rush in a passing situation and scramble and convert a first down and or pick up 15 or 20 yards – are very effective in today's game. We're even seeing it in the NFL. You're seeing the transition of what they are looking for. They want quarterbacks that can move around some because all of the, well, we've talked about this, the increase of defensive linemen that can run at, and they weigh 250 pounds is trickling down to the college level. 
So it's, it's really difficult to say that you can just stand in the pocket and throw the ball downfield. And that's contributing to his runs because he's getting three, four, five scrambles a game. So 10 or 12 called quarterback runs, three or four scrambles a game, and you're right around 31 in two games. And you're sort of looking in the mirror when it comes to playing TCU this week because Max Duggan mm-hmm. is that guy. Sure. And, and so let me ask you this. When you're dealing with that you know, big-time running threat at quarterback, and you also have, as TCU does, running backs that are home run threats, receivers that have great speed that are home run threats, and all of these guys have made big plays. How much more complicated is it to deal with that rushing quarterback when you've got so many threats surrounding that guy? Somebody has to have an idea where the quarterback is. So in your zone coverages, um, you have to cheat guys. They've got to be in a zone, but they've got to have an idea where the quarterback is. If he takes off and runs, you've got to try to keep him in front of you. In man coverage, you got to have an extra guy coming on with pressure or somebody spying the quarterback. Because if he takes off in man and everybody that's supposed to be tackling him is chasing a cover guy, a wide out, then it makes, makes for a difficult time. And it's the same way when people try to defend us. Sure. And the ability for a quarterback to maneuver and convert uh, when protection fails, which at this level, college football, fairly common. Right, 35, 40% of the time, we don't get them all blocked up. The quarterback's got to make a play. That's what you deal with with these type of quarterbacks. So as you look at TCU's defense, last week one of the themes was because of the many different things that Texas Tech did, patience was something we talked about. Hey, Mm -hmm. they're going to get their wins, and Oklahoma State, your team will get theirs. Is it safe to say that that's – a similar thought process this week, but for an entirely different reason. That that because of the way TCU plays defense, you have to be patient, but not for the same reasons. Uh, I, I would say that's accurate, and I would follow up with the thing that we talked about for weeks now is in this conference, you're seeing each week that I don't know what any point spreads are in any of the games. I just know they're not going to be very much. They're going to be one and a half to three to four to five, maybe six point games spreads based on where the game's being played. Uh, and, and anything that's within five and a half points is going to be real equal uh, because you're going to get, you know, five, six points. My point, based on playing at home, my point being that these are going to be each week from here on out. Yeah. We're going to play teams that are going to make plays. We're going to make plays. They're going to make plays. We're going to... And I told the team that. I said, you're not going into games as we move forward with this conference where we're just going to sit back and have a big lead in the, in the second quarter and we can just play other guys and, um, and run, run the ball and run the clock out. I don't see that happening. I don't see that happening in any of these games, much less um, when you're competing against teams that are um, using, like we talked about, running quarterbacks that can make plays and have the ability to play fast some. So Tech was averaging almost 100 plays a game when we went into it last week, this team is only averaging 67, but they have the capability of playing fast. Mm -hmm. So they might play fast. I don't know. We'll we'll just have to wait and see. Well, let's transition right into What's Your Beef. It's brought to you by Old Trapper Beef Jerky. You can see the quality through the clear packaging that Old Trapper features. So let's continue on that thought of some parity. We're seeing a lot of weird results in college football, upsets across the country, games that are close that nobody anticipates would be close. You touched on some of the issues. How much of that maybe is a transfer portal and teams having to sort of maybe need a month or so to settle in? Is that playing a role in some of these games, you think, or no? The transfer portal and NIL is going to change college football. Uh, I'm not sure anybody knows um, how much or exactly what direction it's going to go, but when you take uh, an NFL free agency concept uh, or really even something more than that from the fact that an NFL free agency is on a player whose contract is getting ready to expire. Well, these guys' contracts aren't expiring, and they still have the ability to take off. So it's even more extreme in my opinion. And it is going to change college football uh, from the standpoint that when you put years of service, a couple years of service in a a young man and get him developed, and then if he chooses to go somewhere else – Essentially, 
those years that you put into him haven't you haven't gotten any value out of and for that reason it's changing college football and that's why you're going to see games like this where uh, they're going to be very competitive from start to finish that's what's your beef brought to you by old trapper beef jerky you can see the quality through the clear packaging from old trapper beef jerky back to break down some video and we return Welcome back. Let's break down some video of the win against Texas Tech. And we start after Texas Tech had scored a touchdown to begin the game. This onside kick. And so many people have asked me this week, you call for the fair catch. Did you feel like this was coming? And how much do you have to prepare for that? Because people say, well, how would a guy know just to call for a fair catch? Walk us through what led up to this. So we have a checklist in all four special teams units that is around 15 things that we need to cover on each unit. And this is one of them. This kick is, is, uh, has been going on now for five, six years or so. We talked about this happening in this game, that we felt like they were going to try to steal some possessions, uh, maybe a fake punt, um, this type of bunt, onside, or pop kick, uh, and then going for fourth downs. And so in August, when we have um, – extended walkthroughs players aren't in school we have a lot of time we're training this is one of the things that we cover is if we ever get a pop kick or the the rule where the kicker can drive the ball in the ground once and pop it up high you can yes. fair catch that mm -hmm. that if we get those that whoever is near you need to show fair catch and go get the ball but show fair catch first because if you don't show fair catch then they have the right to get the ball right in front of you. So if you look right here and you watch what happens, I'll stop it when it gets to right, right there. Because the ball's past 10 yards, if we don't show fair catch, he has every right to that ball, or the, the guy from Tech. But once we show fair catch, then we get an opportunity to catch that ball, and they cannot touch the ball or touch us. So essentially that makes the play dead for them unless the ball hits the ground. Got it. And this is something that we coach, and it benefited. I will say this. We were fortunate. The guy that, was, uh, that waved the fair catch has played special teams for a long time. He's a veteran. He's heard it. He's seen it, and he did it. If that would have been a young player, I'm not sure if he'd have done it or not, even though it's been coached. Right. So, right. so basically we, got fortunate. we were fortunate they picked on the wrong guy. And he did exactly what he was coached to do. And so that gives us uh, an opportunity to get the ball right there. Um, kick, kick, catch, interference um, gives us another 15 yards. Uh, and then I think we scored on the second play. Yes, you did. It's a big play in the game because, again, they were trying to seal possessions. Here's another big play. Yeah, this is a third and eight here. And um, Spencer did a good job of avoiding the rush there after the lineman dropped him off, <clears throat> dropped off the screen. And, uh, and converted, uh, and kept the drive alive. Um, our guys really have done a good job on that. And uh, Spencer did a good job of selling it, keeping his eyes to the left, um, pulling in the defense, uh, and then drifting away and then dropping the ball off to the running back. Um, Lyman downfield, blocking right there. Um, kept it alive, kept us going. Now we move forward into the third quarter. Big play here. Sure. We, uh, we have a tie game. Um, and um, Mason Cobb, who uh, is a real student of the game, is sitting here to the field in the middle playing a robber look and um, studies and studies and studies and obviously had a pretty good idea of what was happening. You can look where he's breaking on the ball um, way before um, the ball's thrown over there. He's already breaking right now, and he still has the ball in his hands. So he sees it. He's watched it on tape. He knows what's happening. And more importantly, we've all seen this. He made the catch. A lot of times we see that happen. Bounces off of him. They drop it, whatever. Um, but makes the catch. Uh, and now the uh, good news was uh, it was third down. But either way, um, we get the ball on the 20 um, instead of them having the ability to punt. Coach, I swear we saw that same play on January yep. 1st in the Fiesta Bowl from Malcolm Rodriguez. It was the same concept. So um, Cobb's had a good mentor. Uh, and watched and seen how Malcolm studied the game, how important it was to him, and there he comes right there. That led to the field goal that put Oklahoma State in the lead at 
Yeah, you know, it's interesting, these quarterbacks, watch this release of their quarterback here. See how low this release is? Mm -hmm. All this has changed because of Patrick Mahomes. Really? Very seldom did you see kids throw like this. But see, his, his release is actually almost lower than his shoulder. And uh, it's trending across the country. And he's got zip on the ball, and he's accurate. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, now we're in a fourth and two. Um, ball's on the 44, and uh, we get the big stop. Um, they hit us on a few of these. We hit them on a few. Um, this was one of the adjustments that we made at, uh, in the locker room um, on how to handle this situation versus this play. Um, guys paid attention, got it done, and um, we were able to, uh, um, to find a way to stop them. Cobb gets the first hit. In and basic terms, what did you adjust? How did you change things up? So we, we, we really challenged them on the edge. They hit us early in the game, uh, throwing it out in the flat, and then just kind of blocked us and then just got two yards. You know, we stopped them twice mm -hmm. on those. They only got three, but they only needed two. Mm -hmm. counts yeah. so you really have to say okay I'm going to be aggressive on the perimeter and then inside we have to wedge hard inside because the the blocking scheme they use there if you don't really go after them and, and wedge hard inside it's hard to stop and that's what we did here um, you can see uh, zero coming inside and then um, 93 does a great job getting off a block and making a making a stop so we just um, use the clock um, we were able to convert a first down on this drive and then get into this point where we were in the game. The, the clock is our friend. Um, we forced them to use their timeouts except one. And then we knew at this point, um, if we wouldn't have scored here, they, were, they should have used their next timeout, mm -hmm. which would have been 2.30. Okay? Then on second down, we could run 40 seconds off the clock, which would run it down to, well – if you run the play, you get another three or four, so really 45. So that would have run it down to um, a minute 45-ish. Mm -hmm. And then on third down, you could have run down another 45-ish. So that would have run it down to about a minute. And then you could have kicked the field goal if you needed to or scored, either way. But then you get a two-score lead with a minute left with them with no timeouts. Okay? Or the other thing that I'm thinking is we're not kicking a field goal. You have four downs to score. Um, we don't want to take the, give them a chance to, to throw the ball, throw the ball, throw the ball, get down there, and lose by one. Right, right. So there's two ways to look at this. Um, I would have preferred to score on um, second down because the, if, if, if they use their timeout right here, then that eats their last timeout, and then you score you know, a little bit more of an advantage. But obviously – uh, you know, we're thrilled with what happened because now it became a 10-point game instead of a six-point game. And great effort by uh, Dominic, two hands on the ball, the play's blocked well, and then great power with Materko pulling. It's legal now to pull guys in. So you have Materko pulling and, and uh, Schultz, I think, is pushing, and here comes 61, he's pushing, because you can do that now. And uh, really good job. But this thing's blocked up. We, we, we talked earlier on the show, you know, you mentioned, you said, hey, what do we need to do to run the ball better? Well, this is an example of it. If you look right here, everybody's blocked up. When I say covered up, all these guys are covered up. Covered up, he's covered up, he's covered up, he's covered up, he's covered up. Now you have a second-level defender. Well, that's always going to be that way. Up in the field, this second-level defender is going to be about eight yards deeper. He's much closer to where it's – that second-level guy hit him at six. In the open field, if you block those front guys, the, the second-level guy's not going to hit you till eight or ten. That's what has to happen, okay? But we blocked them all up right there, and that's what you, you've got to do. Everybody's covered up. So he has a lane to get through and not make a cut prior to getting back to the line of scrimmage. Which okay? is exactly that, what that, you're that's talking what, about. That, that's what has to happen. And then we get great push here, and they're pulling them and pulling them and, and get them in the end zone, and now we're in a whole different uh, category. So um, really good win. They're all good wins. Uh, you know, it's interesting. You, you and I talk about this. Uh, I see people at the grocery store, coffee shop, gas station, big game this week, Coach. Every one of them's big. Um, they're all going to be challenging. There's good teams in this league. A lot, of fun for, a lot of fun for the fans, a lot of fun for the media, not as fun for the coaches. <laughs> Understood. Hope you enjoyed our show. We'll see you next week.